Chapter Thirteen of the Life of Clara Barton, Volume One by William Barton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen Clara Barton to the Front. When the author of this volume was a schoolboy, the advanced readers in the public schools partook largely of a patriotic character and the rhetorical exercises of friday afternoons contained recitations and declamations inspired by the great civil war the author remembers a friday when he came upon the platform with his left arm withdrawn from his coat sleeve and concealed inside the coat while he recited a poem of which he still remembers certain lines my arm i lost it at cedar mountain ah little one that was a dreadful fight for brave blood flowed like a summer fountain and the cannon roared till the fall of night nay nay your question has done me no harm dear though it woke for the moment a thrill of pain for whenever i look at my stump of an arm here I seem to be living that day again. The poem went on to relate the scenes of the battle, the desperate charge, the wound, the amputation, and now the necessity of earning a livelihood by the peddling of needles, pins, and other inexpensive household necessities. It was a poem with rather large dramatic possibilities, and the author utilized them according to the best of his then ability. Since that Friday afternoon, in his early boyhood, he has always thought of Cedar Mountain as a battle in which he had something of a share. If he had really been there, and had lost an arm in the manner which the poem described, one of the things he would have been almost certain to remember would have been the presence there of clara barton she afterward told of it in this simple fashion when our armies fought on cedar mountain i broke the shackles and went to the field five days and nights with three hours sleep a narrow escape from capture and some days of getting the wounded into hospitals at washington brought saturday august thirtieth and if you chance to feel that the positions i occupied were rough and unseemly for a woman i can only reply that they were rough and unseemly for men but under all lay the life of the nation i had inherited the rich blessing of health and strength of constitution such as are seldom given to women and i felt that some return was due from me and that i ought to be there the battle of cedar mountain also called cedar run and culpepper was fought on saturday august ninth eighteen sixty two stonewall jackson as directed by general lee moved to attack pope before mcclellan could reinforce him the corps attack was under command of general banks and the confederates were successful the federal losses were three hundred and fourteen killed one thousand four hundred and sixty five wounded and six hundred and twenty two missing news of the battle reached washington on monday clara barton's entry for that day contains no suggestion of the heroic no appearance of consciousness that she was beginning for herself and her country and the civilized world a new epoch in the history of women's ministration to men wounded on the battlefield monday august eleventh eighteen sixty two battle at culpepper reached us went to sanitary commission concluded to go to culpepper packed goods the next day she went to general pope's headquarters and got her pass 
General Rucker accompanying her. The remainder of the day she spent in completing her arrangements and in conference with Gardner Tufts of Massachusetts, an agent sent by the state to look after Massachusetts wounded. That night she went to Alexandria, which was as far as she could get, and the next morning she resumed her journey and arrived at Culpeper at half-past three in the afternoon. The next days were busy days. It is interesting to find in her diary that she ministered not only to the Union, but also to the Confederate wounded. For several days she had little rest. When she returned to Washington later in the month, she was not permitted to remain. She learned that her cousin, Corporal Poor, had been brought to a hospital in the city, but she was unable to visit him, being called to minister to the wounded who were being brought to Alexandria as the result of the fighting that followed Cedar Mountain. Her hastily written note is not dated, but the time is in the latter part of August, 1862. My own darling cousin, I was almost, all but, ready to come to you, and then came this bloody fight at Culpeper, and the state agent for Massachusetts comes and claims me to go to Alexandria, where six hundred wounded are to be brought in today, and I may have to go in further. I hope to be back yet in time to come to you this week. If not, I will write you. I am distressed that I cannot come to you tomorrow as I had intended. I hope you are as well as when I last heard. I should have written, but I thought to come so soon. I must leave now. My wagon waits for me. God bless you, my poor dear cousin, and I will see you if the rebels don't catch me. Goodbye, your affectionate cousin, Clara. Whether she was able to visit her cousin or not, on her return from Alexandria, we do not know. Her diary for the latter part of the year, 1862, ceases to be consecutive. It contains not the record of her own comings and goings, but names of wounded soldiers, memoranda of letters to write for men who had died, and other data of this character. Her entry for Saturday, August 30th, 1862, is significant. It reads, Visited Armory Hospital, took comb to Sergeant Field of Massachusetts 21st. On my way saw everybody going to wharf. I went. This was her last record for more than a week. We know what was taking the people to the wharf. We know what sad sights awaited those who made their way to the Potomac. We know the sad procession that came over the Long Bridge. The second battle of Bull Run had been fought. After the first battle of Bull Run, there was nothing she could do but stay in Washington and write her father such distracting news that she had to stop. The situation was different now. Clara Barton knew where she was needed, and she had authority to go. No time was wasted now in special passes. She had proved the value of her worth at Cedar Mountain. That very night she was in a boxcar on her way to the battlefield. Shortly after the Second Battle of Bull Run, Clara Barton wrote the following account to a friend, and later revised it as a part of one of her war lectures. It is, in some respects, the most vivid of all her recitals of experiences on battlefields. Our coaches were not elegant or commodious. They had no windows, no seats, no platforms, no steps. A slide door on the side was the only entrance, and this higher than my head. 
for my manner of attaining my elevated position i must beg of you to draw on your own imaginations and spare me the labor of reproducing the boxes barrels boards and rails which in those days seemed to help me up and on in the world we did not criticize the unsightly helpers and were only too thankful that the stiff springs did not quite jostle us out this description need not be limited to this particular trip or train but will suffice for all that i have known in army life this is the kind of conveyance by which your tons of generous gifts have reached the field with the precious freights these trains through day and night sunshine and rain heat and cold have thundered over heights across plains through ravines and over hastily built army bridges ninety feet across the rocky stream beneath at ten o'clock sunday august thirty first our train drew up at fairfax station the ground for acres was a thinly wooded slope and among the trees on the leaves and grass were laid the wounded who were pouring in by scores of wagon loads as picked up on the field under the flag of truce all day they came and the whole hillside was covered bales of hay were broken open and scattered over the ground like littering for cattle and the sore famishing men were laid upon it and when the night shut in in the mist and darkness about us we knew that standing apart from the world of anxious hearts throbbing over the whole country we were a little band of almost empty-handed workers literally by ourselves in the wild woods of virginia with three thousand suffering men crowded upon the few acres within our reach after gathering up every available implement or convenience for our work our domestic inventory stood two water buckets five tin cups one camp kettle one stew pan two lanterns four bread knives three plates and a two quart tin dish and three thousand guests to serve you will perceive by this that I had not yet learned to equip myself, for I was no palace, ready armed, but grew into my work by hard thinking and sad experience. It may serve to relieve your apprehension for the future of my labors if I assure you that I was never caught so again. You have read of adverse winds to realize this in its full sense you have only to build a campfire and attempt to cook something on it there is not a soldier within the sound of my voice but will sustain me in the assertion that go whichsoever side of it you will wind will blow the smoke and flame directly in your face notwithstanding these difficulties within fifteen minutes from the time of our arrival we were preparing food and dressing wounds you wonder what and how prepared and how administered without dishes you generous thoughtful mothers and wives have not forgotten the tons of preserves and fruits with which you filled our hands huge boxes of these stood beside that railway track every can jar bucket bowl cup or tumbler when emptied that instant became a vehicle of mercy to convey some preparation of mingled bread and wine or soup or coffee to some helpless famishing sufferer who partook of it with the tears rolling down his bronzed cheeks and divided his blessings between the hands that fed him and his god i never realized until that day how little a human being could be grateful for 
and that day's experience also taught me the utter worthlessness of that which could not be made to contribute directly to our necessities the bit of bread which would rest on the surface of a gold eagle was worth more than the coin itself but the most fearful scene was reserved for the night i have said that the ground was littered with dry hay and that we had only two lanterns but there were plenty of candles the wounded were laid so close that it was impossible to move about in the dark the slightest misstep brought a torrent of groans from some poor mangled fellow in your path consequently here were seen persons of all grades from the careful man of god who walked with a prayer upon his lips to the careless driver hunting for his lost whip each wandering about among this hay with an open flaming candle in his hand the slightest accident the mere dropping of a light could have enveloped in flames this whole mass of helpless men how we watched and pleaded and cautioned as we worked and wept that night how we put socks and slippers upon their cold damp feet wrapped your blankets and quilts about them and when we had no longer these to give how we covered them in the hay and left them to their rest on monday september first the enemy's cavalry appeared in the wood opposite and a raid was hourly expected in the afternoon all the wounded men were sent off and the danger became so imminent that mrs fales thought best to leave although she only went for stores i begged to be excused from accompanying her as the ambulances were up to the fields for more and I knew I should never leave a wounded man there if I were taken prisoner forty times. At six o'clock it commenced to thunder and lightning, and all at once the artillery began to play, joined by the musketry about two miles distant. We sat down in our tent and waited to see them break in, but Reno's forces held them back the old twenty-first massachusetts lay between us and the enemy and they could not pass god only knows who was lost i do not for the next day all fell back poor kearney stephen and webster were brought in and in the afternoon kearney's and heinzelman's divisions fell back through our camp on their way to alexandria we knew this was the last we put the thousand wounded men we then had into the train i took one carload of them and mrs m another the men took to the horses we steamed off and two hours later there was no fairfax station we reached alexandria at ten o'clock at night and oh the repast which met those poor men at the train the people of the island are the most noble i ever saw or heard of i stood in my car and fed the men till they could eat no more then the people would take us home and feed us and after that we came home i had slept one and one half hours since saturday night and i am well and strong and wait to go again if i have need immediately after the second bull run or manassas followed the battle of chantilly it was a woeful battle for the federal cause the confederates were completely successful pope's army retreated to washington in almost as great a state of panic as had characterized the army of mcdowell in the previous year Nothing saved Washington from capture but the fact that the Confederate forces had been so reduced by continuous fighting that they were unable to take advantage of their success. But they had captured the Federal wagon trains, 
had inflicted far greater losses than they had themselves endured and were in so confident a frame of mind that lee immediately prepared to cross the potomac invade the north and bring the war as he hoped to a speedy end it was under these conditions that clara barton continued her education at the battlefront among many other experiences on the field of chantilly miss barton recalled these incidents the slight naked chest of a fair-haired lad caught my eye and dropping down beside him i bent low to draw the remnant of his torn blouse about him when with a quick cry he threw his left arm across my neck and burying his face in the folds of my dress wept like a child at his mother's knee i took his head in my hands and held it until his great burst of grief passed away and do you know me he asked at length i am charlie hamilton who used to carry your satchel home from school my faithful pupil poor charlie that mangled right arm would never carry a satchel again about three o'clock in the morning i observed a surgeon with his little flickering candle in hand approaching me with cautious step far up in the wood lady he said as he drew near will you go with me out on the hills is a poor distressed lad mortally wounded and dying his piteous cries for his sister have touched all our hearts and none of us can relieve him but rather seem to distress him by our presence by this time i was following him back over the bloody track with great beseeching eyes of anguish on every side looking up into our faces saying so plainly don't step on us he can't last half an hour longer said the surgeon as we toiled on he is already quite cold shot through the abdomen a terrible wound by this time the cries became plainly audible to me mary mary sister mary come oh come i am wounded mary i am shot i am dying oh come to me i have called you so long and my strength is almost gone don't let me die here alone oh mary mary come of all the tones of entreaty to which i have listened and certainly i have had some experience of sorrow i think these sounding through that dismal night the most heartrending as we drew near some twenty persons attracted by his cries had gathered around and stood with moistened eyes and helpless hands waiting the change which would relieve them all and in the midst stretched upon the ground lay scarcely full grown a young man with a graceful head of hair tangled and matted thrown back from a forehead and a face of livid whiteness his throat was bare his hands bloody clasped his breast his large bewildered eyes turning anxiously in every direction and ever from between his ashen lips pealed that piteous cry of mary mary come i approached him unobserved and motioning the lights away i knelt by him alone in the darkness shall i confess that i intended if possible to cheat him out of his terrible death agony but my lips were truer than my heart and would not speak the word brother i had willed them to do so i placed my hands upon his neck kissed his cold forehead and laid my cheek against his the illusion was complete the act had done the falsehood 
my lips refused to speak. I can never forget that cry of joy. Oh, Mary, Mary, you have come. I knew you would come if I called you, and I have called you so long. I could not die without you, Mary. Don't cry, darling. I'm not afraid to die now that you have come to me. Oh, bless you. Bless you, Mary. And he ran his cold, blood-wet hands round my neck, passed them over my face, and twined them in my hair, which by this time had freed itself from fastenings and was hanging damp and heavy upon my shoulders. He gathered the loose locks in his stiffened fingers, and holding them to his lips, continued to whisper through them, Bless you, bless you, Mary and I felt the hot tears of joy trickling from the eyes I had thought stony in death. This encouraged me, and wrapping his feet closely in blankets, and giving him such stimulants as he could take, I seated myself on the ground and lifted him on my lap, and drawing the shawl on my own shoulders, also about his, I bade him rest. I listened till his blessings grew fainter, and in ten minutes with them on his lips he fell asleep. So the gray morning found us. My precious charge had grown warm and was comfortable. Of course the morning light would reveal his mistake, but he had grown calm and was refreshed and able to endure it. And when finally he woke, he seemed puzzled for a moment, but then he smiled and said, I knew before I opened my eyes that this couldn't be Mary. I know now that she couldn't get here, but it is almost as good. You've made me so happy. Who is it? I said it was simply a lady who, hearing that he was wounded, had come to care for him. He wanted the name, and with childlike simplicity he spelled it letter by letter to know if he were right. In my pocket, he said, you will find mother's last letter. Please get it and write your name upon it, for I want both names by me when I die. Will they take away the wounded? he asked. Yes, I replied. The first train for Washington is nearly ready now. I must go, he said quickly. Are you able? I asked. I must go if I die on the way. I'll tell you why. I am poor mother's only son, and when she consented that I go to the war, I promised her faithfully that if I were not killed outright but wounded, I would try every means in my power to be taken home to her, dead or alive. If I die on the train, they will not throw me off. And if I were buried in Washington, she can get me. But out here in the Virginia woods, in the hands of the enemy, never. I must go. I sent for the surgeon in charge of the train, and requested that my boy be taken. Oh, impossible, madam. He is mortally wounded and will never reach the hospital. We must take those who have a hope of life. But you must take him. I cannot. Can you, doctor, guarantee the lives of all you have on that train? I wish I could, said he sadly. They are the worst cases. Nearly fifty per cent must die eventually of their wounds and hardships. Then give this lad a chance with them. He can only die, and he has given good and sufficient reasons why he must go. And a woman's word for it, doctor. You take him. Send your men for him. Whether yielding to argument or entreaty, I neither knew nor cared so long as he did yield 
nobly and kindly and they gathered up the fragments of the poor torn boy and laid him carefully on a blanket on the crowded train and with stimulants and food and a kind-hearted attendant pledged to take him alive or dead to armory square hospital and tell them he was hugh johnson of new york and to mark his grave although three hours of my time had been devoted to one sufferer among thousands it must not be inferred that our general work had been suspended or that my assistance had been equally inefficient they had seen how i was engaged and nobly redoubled their exertions to make amends for my deficiencies probably not a man was laid upon those cars who did not receive some personal attention at their hands some little kindness if it were only to help lift him more tenderly this finds us shortly after daylight monday morning train after train of cars was rushing on for the wounded and hundreds of wagons were bringing them in from the field still held by the enemy where some poor sufferers had lain three days with no visible means of sustenance if immediately placed upon the trains and not detained at least twenty-four hours must elapse before they could be in the hospital and properly nourished they were already famishing weak and sinking from loss of blood and they could ill afford a further fast of twenty-four hours i felt confident that unless nourished at once all the weaker portion must be past recovery before reaching the hospitals of washington if once taken from the wagons and laid with those already cared for they would be overlooked and perish on the way something must be done to meet this fearful emergency i sought the various officers on the grounds explained the case to them and asked permission to feed all the men as they arrived before they should be taken from the wagons it was well for the poor sufferers of that field that it was controlled by noble-hearted generous officers quick to feel and prompt to act they at once saw the propriety of my request and gave orders that all wagons should be stayed at a certain point and only moved on when every one had been seen and fed this point secured i commenced my day's work of climbing from the wheel to the brake of every wagon and speaking to and feeding with my own hands each soldier until he expressed himself satisfied still there were bright spots along the darkened lines early in the morning the provost marshal came to ask me if i could use fifty men he had that number who for some slight breach of military discipline were under guard and useless unless i could use them i only regretted there were not five hundred they came strong willing men and these added to our original force and what we had gained incidentally made our number something over eighty and believe me eighty men and three women acting with well-directed purpose will accomplish a good deal in a day our fifty prisoners dug graves and gathered and buried the dead bore mangled men over the rough ground in their arms loaded cars built fires made soup and administered it and i failed to discern that their services were less valuable than those of the other men i had long suspected and have been since convinced that a private soldier may be placed under guard court-martialed and even be imprisoned without forfeiting his honor or manliness that the real dishonor is often upon the gold lace 
rather than the army blue. At three o'clock, the last train of wounded left. All day we had known that the enemy hung upon the hills and were waiting to break in upon us. At four o'clock, the clouds gathered black and murky and the low growl of distant thunders was heard while lightning continually illuminated the horizon. The still air grew thick and stifled, and the very branches appeared to droop and bow, as if in grief at the memory of the terrible scenes so lately enacted and the gallant lives so nobly yielded up beneath their shelter. This was the afternoon of Monday. Since Saturday noon, I had not thought of tasting food, and we had just drawn around a box for that purpose, when, of a sudden, air and earth and all about us shook with one mingled crash of God's and man's artillery. The lightning played and the thunder rolled incessantly, and the cannon roared louder and nearer each minute. Chantilly, with all its darkness and horrors, had opened in the rear. The description of this battle I leave to those who saw and moved in it, as it is my purpose to speak only of events in which I was a witness or actor. Although two miles distant, we knew the battle was intended for us, and watched the firing as it neared and receded, and waited minute by minute for the rest. With what desperation our men fought hour after hour in the rain and darkness! How they were overborne and rallied! How they suffered from mistaken orders and blundered! and lost themselves in the strange mysterious wood and how after all with giant strength and veteran bravery they checked the foe and held him at bay as an all-proud record of history and the courage of the soldier who braved death in the darkness of chantilly let no man question the rain continued to pour in torrents and the darkness became impenetrable, save from the lightning leaping above our heads and the fitful flash of the guns as volley after volley rang through the stifled air and lighted up the gnarled trunks and dripping branches among which we ever waited and listened. In the midst of this, and how guided no man knows, still came another train of wounded men and a waiting train of cars upon the track received them this time nearly alone for my worn-out assistance could work no longer i continued to administer such food as i had left do you begin to wonder what it could be army crackers put into knapsacks and haversacks and beaten to crumbs between stones and stirred into a mixture of wine whiskey and water and sweetened with coarse brown sugar not very inviting you will think but i assure you it was always acceptable but whether it should have been classed as food like the widow bedott's cabbage as a delightful beverage it would puzzle an epicure to determine no matter so it imparted strength and comfort the departure of this train cleared the grounds of wounded for the night and as the line of fire from its plunging engines died out in the darkness a strange sensation of weakness and weariness fell upon me almost defying my utmost exertion to move one foot before the other. A little Sibley tent had been hastily pitched for me in a slight hollow upon the hillside. Your imaginations will not fail to picture its condition. Rivulets of water had rushed through it during the last three hours. Still, I attempted to reach it 
as its white surface in the darkness was a protection from the wheels of wagons and trampling of beasts perhaps i shall never forget the painful effort which the making of those few rods and the gaining of the tent cost me how many times i fell from sheer exhaustion and the darkness and mud of that slippery hillside i have no knowledge but at last i grasped the welcome canvas and a well-established brook which washed in upon the upper side of the opening that served as a door met me on my entrance my entire floor was covered with water not an inch of dry solid ground one of my lady assistants had previously taken train for washington and the other worn out by faithful labors was crouched upon the top of some boxes in one corner fast asleep no such convenience remained for me and i had no strength to arrange one i sought the highest side of my tent which i remembered was grass-grown and ascertaining that the water was not very deep i sank down it was no laughing matter then but the recollection of my position has since afforded me amusement i remember myself sitting on the ground upheld by my left arm my head resting on my hand impelled by an almost uncontrollable desire to lie completely down and prevented by the certain conviction that if i did water would flow into my ears how long i balanced between my desires and cautions i have no positive knowledge but it is very certain that the former carried the point by the position from which i was aroused at twelve o'clock by the rumbling of more wagons of wounded men i slept two hours and oh what strength i had gained i may never know two other hours of equal worth i sprang to my feet dripping wet covered with ridges of dead grass and leaves wrung the water from my hair and skirts and went forth again into my work when i stood again under the sky the rain had ceased the clouds were sullenly retiring and the lightning as if deserted by its boisterous companions had withdrawn to a distant corner and was playing quietly by itself for the great volleying thunders of heaven and earth had settled down on the fields silent i said so and it was save the ceaseless rumbling of the never-ending train of army wagons which brought alike the wounded the dying and the dead and thus the morning of the third day broke upon us drenched weary hungry sore-footed sad-hearted discouraged and under orders to retreat a little later the plaintive wail of a single fife the slow beat of a muffled drum the steady tramp 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 of heavy feet the gleam of ten thousand bayonets on the hills and with bowed heads and speechless lips poor kearney's leaderless men came marching through this was the signal for retreat all day they came tired hungry ragged defeated retreating they knew not whither they cared not whither the enemy's cavalry skirting the hills admonished us each moment that we must soon decide to go from them or with them but our work must be accomplished and no wounded men once given into our hands must be left and with the spirit of desperation we struggled on at three o'clock an officer galloped up to me with miss barton can you ride yes sir i replied 
but you have no lady's saddle could you ride mine yes sir or without it if you have blanket and sir single then you can risk another hour he exclaimed and galloped off at four he returned at a breakneck speed and leaping from his horse said now is your time the enemy is already breaking over the hills try the train it will go through unless they have flanked and cut the bridge a mile above us in that case i've a reserve horse for you and you must take your chances to escape across the country in two minutes i was on the train the last wounded man at the station was also on the conductor stood with a torch which he applied to a pile of combustible material beside the track and we rounded the curve which took us from view and we saw the station ablaze and a troop of cavalry dashing down the hill the bridge was uncut and midnight found us at washington you have the full record of my sleep from friday night till wednesday morning two hours you will not wonder that i slept during the next twenty-four on friday the following i repaired to armory square hospital to learn who of all the hundred sent had reached that point i traced the chaplain's record and there upon the last page freshly written stood the name of hugh johnson turning to chaplain jackson i asked did that man live until today he died during the latter part of last night he replied his friends reached him some two days ago and they are now taking his body from the ward to be conveyed to the depot i looked in the direction his hand indicated and there beside a coffin about to be lifted into a wagon stood a gentleman the mother and sister mary had he his reason i asked oh perfectly and his mother and sister were with him two days yes there was no need of me he had given his own messages i could add nothing to their knowledge of him and would fain be spared the scene of thanks poor hugh thy piteous prayers reached and were answered and with eyes and heart full i turned away and never saw sister mary these were days of darkness a darkness that might be felt the shattered bands of pope and banks burnside's weary legions reinforcements from west virginia and all that now remained of the once glorious army of the peninsula had gathered for shelter beneath the redoubt and guns that girdled washington how the soldiers remembered these ministrations is shown in letters such as this charles e simmons secretary twenty first regiment massachusetts volunteers charles e fry president seven jacques avenue worcester mass september thirteenth nineteen eleven to clara barton the survivors of the veteran twenty first massachusetts regiment assembled in odd fellows temple in the city of worcester wish to put on record the day of your coming to us at bull run and chantilly when we were in our deepest bereavement and loss how your presence and deeds brought assurance and comfort and how you assisted us up the hot and rugged sides of south mountain by your ministry forty-nine years ago to-day at and over the burnside bridge at antietam and then through pleasant valley to falmouth and in course of time were across the rappahannock and storming the heights of fredericksburg were with us indeed when we recrossed the river and found shelter in our tents 
broken, bruised, and sheared. With us evermore in body and spirit, lo, these fifty years, the prayer of the twenty-first regiment is, God bless our old and tried friend. It was also voted that we present to Clara Barton a bouquet of flowers. Charles E. Simmons, Secretary. End of chapter 13